You may wish to take a moment and pause the video and reread this problem before listening on. In order for us to find the accelerations of the block and of the slab, we're going to need to draw a free body diagram for each object, which shows the forces that are acting on those objects. So here is a zoomed in view of the scenario, and we've got the slab and the block. We're going to draw the free body diagram for the block first. So again, you might pause the video and think about what forces are acting on the block, which is also M2. And of course, we have a downward gravitational force exerted on the block. So we're going to label that force M2 times G. We can see from the diagram that there is an applied force F pulling the block to the left. So we're going to label that accordingly. And we have a normal force as well. It's resting upon a slab and the slab is pushing up on the block. So that is a normal force. We're going to label that F sub 2, or excuse me, F sub N 2 for the normal force acting on M2. And then there's also friction. You can see they've drawn this sort of rough surface between the block and the slab. We just have to figure out which direction the friction would be pointing. The applied force F is pulling the block to the left and friction is trying to sort of oppose that applied force. So this friction is going to be pointing to the right. And for the moment, we're going to assume that it is static friction. And so what we're doing is assuming that this block, M2, is not sliding along the top surface of the slab. We're going to check that assumption as we solve this problem. Right now, again, we're assuming that it is a static frictional force rather than a kinetic frictional force because we're just going to assume that it's not sliding along the top of the slab. So those would be the forces acting on the block. Let's turn to the slab next. And we have the downward gravitational force acting on the slab, which is also M1. So that gravitational force would be M sub 1 times G. We have the surface upon which the slab is on pushing up on the slab. That's a normal force. So that's going to be F sub N1. That's the normal force on the slab. And then we can start thinking about Newton's third law. So go back to the block for a moment and remember that the slab was pushing up on the block. That was a normal force. But if the slab is pushing up on the block, then the block must push down on the slab. And so, since the slab pushes up with a force of N, excuse me, Fn sub 2, then the block pushes back down on the slab with that same force, same magnitude force. So we have to draw a downward acting force here. We're going to call that F sub N2. Furthermore, let's consider the frictional force that was acting on the block. That frictional force, which we had labeled F sub S, that was a consequence of the slab pushing back on the block. But if the slab pushes back on the block, then the block pushes in the opposite direction on the slab. So there's got to be the same magnitude force acting on the slab. That's very important. We'll state it again. If the slab, through friction, is pushing back on the block to the right, then the block has to push to the left on the slab with the same magnitude of force. So that was the static frictional force. So these are the free body diagrams illustrating the forces acting on these two bodies. Now, after you draw a free body diagram, you want to pivot to applying Newton's second law. So let's return to the block. Let's look at the x direction. We're going to assign a positive to the right and a negative to the left. So we could write the following equation. We know that the net force in the x direction has to equal the mass of block 2 times its acceleration. And so we have in the x direction the positive static frictional force and then the negative acting applied force F. And that's going to equal n sub 2 times a. So that would be for the x direction. Let's do something similar in the y direction. Now, the block is not accelerating in the y direction. Hopefully we can recognize that the block is not accelerating upward like a rocket, nor is it accelerating downward like some weird tunneling apparatus. Its acceleration in the y direction is zero. So we could say, if we assign upward positive, downward negative, we could say that f sub n2 which is positive, minus m2g, that's just going to equal zero because, again, there's no acceleration in the y direction. So these equations are going to be useful to us. Let's highlight them. We're going to apply similar concepts for the slab. So again, in the x direction, 
we can assign the rightward direction positive and the leftward negative. Let's do the x direction here. You'll notice there's only one force acting in the x direction. It's that F sub S. It's acting in the negative direction. So we would say negative F sub S. And that's going to equal M1 times the acceleration. In the y direction, the slab is not accelerating. Same like the block. So assigning upward positive, downward negative, we could say F sub N1 minus F sub N2 minus m1g that's going to be set equal to zero so these two equations are also going to be significant to us now remember right now we are assuming that static friction is the type of friction that is present in this problem it would be the static friction that's accelerating m2 to the left well in fact it would be the sum of the applied force and the static friction that's accelerating it to the left but as far as the slab is concerned the only force acting to the left is that static frictional force now these two blocks since they're not sliding past each other they would accelerate together so under the assumption of static friction these two blocks are basically kind of sticking together they're not sliding with respect to each other since they're kind of sticking together they would have the same acceleration under this assumption of static friction so what we're going to do is we're going to solve for the acceleration and then from that we're going to solve for the static friction but then we'll discover something interesting so we'll sort of leave that as a cliffhanger for now our goal is to solve for the acceleration now again the accelerations are the same and therefore we've labeled them just a as opposed to a1 and a2 how do we solve them well what we'll do is actually take this equation and solve for f sub s you'll see why in just a moment so let's rewrite it we have negative f sub s is equal to m1 a divide both sides by negative one and then you have f sub s is equal to negative m sub one times a we're going to do a substitution method we're going to take this expression in brackets for f sub s and we're going to plug it in right there so if we do that we would have negative m sub one a minus f equals m sub 2 times a now this is convenient because we know the masses and we know the applied force f we can go back and gather those values the applied force f was 100 newtons the m1 is 40 and m2 was 10 kilograms so let's go ahead and plug those values into this equation now to solve this for a we could add 40 a to both sides this would give us negative 100 is equal to 50a and then divide by 50 we would get an acceleration of negative two meters per second squared so both blocks would be accelerating at that rate now let's use that to solve for f sub s let's return to this equation right here we can take the value of m sub one plug that in 40 kilograms and then the acceleration that we just determined and we can see that f sub s would equal 80 newtons now at this point Maybe you're wondering, okay, great, we're doing a great job. We've got the acceleration. The problem has been solved. But there will be a problem here because we've assumed static friction. We've assumed that the blocks are not sliding with respect to each other. And that may be a fair assumption, but what we need to do is check what the maximum value of the static friction is. Because it may not be 80 newtons. It may be something less than 80 newtons. And if the static friction is less than 80 newtons, then we have a problem because then the blocks are going to slide with respect to each other. The static frictional force wouldn't be sufficient to prevent them from sliding because again, right now, the static friction is 80 newtons. So let's see if the maximum am amount of static friction was 80 newtons or maybe even larger than 80 newtons, in which case we'll be okay. So how do we find the maximum value of the static frictional force? Well, let's look back at our equations. And in particular, let's look back at the equation for the block in the y direction. What we're going to do is take that equation and solve it for the normal force. We know that the normal force helps determine the value of the maximum static frictional force. So looking at that y direction equation, we could add m sub 2g to both sides. So we would see that the normal force acting on block 2 is equal to m sub 2 times g. Now, let's plug in m sub 2 and g to get the value of the normal force. And when we do that, we would see that the normal force acting on block 2 is 98 newtons. So far, so good. But now, let's look at static friction. We all know that static friction 
would equal the coefficient of static friction multiplied by the normal force, in this case the normal force acting on block 2. Well, the coefficient of static friction was 0 0.6, and then we have the normal force of 98 newtons. Now, something interesting happens here. When we compute this static frictional force, this maximum amount of static frictional force that can exert on block 2, we end up with around 59 newtons. That's the maximum value of static friction. But when we solved for static friction, we got 80 newtons. So in order for the blocks to accelerate together, in order for them to basically stick together and accelerate as a single body, we would need a static frictional force of 80 newtons. But the maximum is only 59. So we don't have enough static friction to hold the blocks together, and therefore they are not going to stick together. So we did a lot of work, but what we're realizing here is that static friction was the wrong type of friction. It was the wrong assumption to assume that the blocks are sticking together and accelerating in unison. So we have to reevaluate the equations, and instead of using the coefficient of static friction, we're going to be using kinetic friction. So this means that the blocks won't stick together. They're going to actually slide with respect to each other. Let's look again at the equations. Now we've made a couple of important modifications to take note of. Again, we're now using kinetic friction rather than static, so we've changed the subscript of friction to K to represent kinetic friction. In addition, we can no longer assume the blocks are accelerating at the same rate. They're not sticking together, they're not accelerating in unison. So instead of using A for acceleration, we have used A sub one for block one and A sub two for block two. Let's look at block two. We're going to just take the normal force. We've solved for this already. We know the normal force acting on block two was m sub two times g, and that worked out to be 98 newtons. And therefore we can compute the kinetic frictional force because the kinetic frictional force is equal to the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force acting on block two. So we would plug in 0.4 because that was given in the problem for the coefficient of kinetic friction and then the 98 newtons. Now, 0.4 by 98 is 39.2. So the kinetic friction acting on block two is 39.2 newtons. That's good because look back at the X equation. We can plug that in for F sub K, the 39.2 newtons, and we can plug 100 newtons in for F because that was given in the problem. Along with M2, we know that value, we can solve for the acceleration of block two. So why don't we just for clarity take this equation and kind of scoot it down here and start plugging in. So again, the kinetic friction we just solved, the applied force was 100 and M2 was 10 kilograms. Let's go ahead and solve for A2. The left side here is negative 60.8 and then divide that by 10 to get A2. And at long last, we have the acceleration of the block. The acceleration of the block is going to be negative 6.08 meters per second squared they want it in unit vector notation. We've already stated that the blocks are accelerating in the horizontal direction, the x direction. So in unit vector notation, they would represent the x direction as i hat. So this is the final answer for the acceleration of block two. We can now get the acceleration of block one, because if we return to the equation in the x direction, we'll paste it right here. This is for block one. We'll take F sub k, which we've already solved for, and then the mass of block one is 40 kilograms. If we divide those two values, we end up with around negative 0.98. That's an acceleration, so that's meters per second squared. And then to write it in the unit vector notation, we can say that the acceleration of the slab, which is object one, is negative 0.98 meters per second squared. This was in the horizontal direction, so that is also going to be I hat. That is the final answer for the acceleration of the slab. So again, notice they're not accelerating in unison. It was not appropriate for us to assume static friction and to assume that they were accelerating in unison, though we sort of had to check that. We had to see if that assumption was correct. It turned out not to be correct, and so we pivoted to using kinetic friction instead of static friction.